So next we have uh, Grant Brandstetter, and uh, his topic is uh, long-lived uh, extratropical responses to short-lived um, uh, tropical events. Good morning. I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to, to participate in this uh, symposium. I really admire Shukla in that he's a person who really gets things done. And what's special about uh, many of the, uh, his achievements is that they provide opportunities for other people to excel. I'm thinking in terms of um, founding ECOLA, the founding of the uh, climate program at ICTP, uh, Gandhi College. These are all achievements that Shukla's done that's helped other people, including myself. Um, but the uh, additional um, achievement that I think is especially appropriate for this a symposium is his um, successful energetic advocacy for the idea that there is, in fact, predictability in the midst of chaos for the atmosphere. Because, because of his advocacy, there's been um, much more support for scientists like me to pursue these kind of ideas than there probably would have been without his uh, support. So I want to um, show you some work that I've uh, done recently that's been um, that's related to some ideas uh, having to do with there being predictability um, in the midst of chaos. And there, uh, the work that I want to tell you about is uh, building on um, ideas that are um, used in Shukla's paper in Science in 1998, in which um, he, gave, uh, uh, he presented the, perhaps the prime example of there being um, predictability um, namely, the response of the uh, atmosphere to long-lasting El Nino events. But the way I'm trying to uh, generalize this idea is to um, go beyond the response of the system to stationary heating in the tropics. And the reason I'm doing that is um, motivated by this uh, plot of the variability of OLR during the northern winter. The top plot is just the da daily variance of OLR. And so you can see that there are, there's a lot of day-to-day uh, -day variability in uh, precipitation in the tropics. The bottom plot is showing what fraction of that variability is more or less quasi-stationary. It's the, it's the fraction which um, is captured by uh, in the, in the interannual component of the variability. And so the, the message from this diagram is that, in fact, quasi-stationary heating events are just a small fraction of the heating events that are going on in the tropics. So one would like to learn something about how these other heating events might influence what's going on in mid-latitudes. So this is a problem that has, in fact, been studied somewhat, mostly in a linear framework. Um, but from what we've learned from the, the more heavily studied steady uh, problem, we know that the way this system reacts to tropical heating, at least in a steady problem, is somewhat more complicated than what can be captured in a linear framework. So as valuable as the linear framework is, we'd like to go beyond that. So how, how does one do that? Of course, it's natural to uh, perhaps want to employ a general circulation model, but to do that in a systematic way is problematic. And so the way we've decided to do this is to think in terms of a simpler problem, and that is to, to learn how a general circulation model reacts to a pulse of heating in the tropics. And the reason we think uh, this is a useful uh, framework is that you can any uh, time-dependent forcing can be decomposed into a sequence of pulses. So I think of the responses that I'm now going to show you as being the building blocks, which, which when combined, can you can learn how the system would react to any time-dependent forcing in the tropics. So here's how we went about doing this. We took a very long uh, run of a general circulation model. You can think of this uh, time series uh, that's sketched here as lasting thousands of years. And then we've taken one, one specific state from that long sequence, and we've started a new integration 
in which we've inserted a heat source, a local heat source at some region in the tropics, and we've done a second integration then, and the difference between the original control and this new uh, experiment is, is, is how we find out how the general circulation model reacted to the fact that we had put a pulse of heating into the system. Now, it's, as I'm going to show you, or as it turns out, that the response is very high, dependent on the initial conditions. So we've done this many times. We've done this, in fact, for 2,000 different initial uh, states. And what I'm going to show you then is the average across those 2,000. So this is, you can think of this as being an average over the attractor of the model. So this is more like, this is more um, analogous to a climate change experiment, but it's just over a, a very short time. These, these, these uh, pulse experiments uh, last only 20 days. And the pulse um, is on for only the first two days of, these, of each of these experiments. So here's an example of the ensemble average response to a pulse. In this case, the pulse, uh, the heated source was a small disk put on the equator at 90 east. And the top panel is showing you in terms of the meridional wind anomalies what the response of the system was after two days. So this is after the heat source has been um, on for two days. And so, as you'd expect, the response is fairly close to where the source was. The, next, the middle panel is showing you what the, res, what the response is at day five. So the evolution from the first to the second panel has all taken place without there being any additional heating now in the model. So this, the, the, and yet the response, I think you'll agree, has, has gotten stronger as it's um, propagated into mid-latitudes. The bottom panel is the response after eight days. So most of this evolution has taken place without there being any uh, heating going on. Now it turns out that the response is in fact qualitatively similar to, irrespective of the, the longitude at which one puts the pulse. So here's a, the right column is for a pulse um, at a different position at the date line, or I mean at the prime meridian. And so you can see that to a first approximation that one solution is just a um, longitudinal um, movement uh, shift relative to the, to the other. But the details of the response, in fact, do depend on the position of the pulse. And so what we've done is do um, 24 such pulse experiments at 24 different positions on the, on the equator. And so together, these form something like a slice of a Green's function that tells you, in general, how the system is going to respond at a given lag to a pulse at a given position. Okay, so as I said, one reason or a reason to uh, examine such things is that they can, these pulse responses then, can then be combined to um, estimate how the system would react to any arbitrary um, evolution of a tropical heat source. And so here's just an example of that. I'm thinking in terms of an experiment in which we um, of having a heat source that's moving towards the east at about five meters per second, which is supposed to be an I then an idealized uh, counterpart to an MJO event. And the um, figure on the right is showing what the response was is to that moving source when the source is at 135 east. But you can think of it as being decomposed into the lagged response to a sequence of pulses, each pulse being at a different position um, on the equator. And so that's what the left panel is showing. This is part of the decomposition into the response to, the pulse at, to a pulse at different positions. So for example, when the heat source 10 days earlier was at about 95 east, it's inducing a response which 10 days later has the structure shown, with, and so even though the, this, the pulse, the heat source was um, quite a bit west of it, the position we're really interested in, and it was occurring 10 days earlier, it in fact is inducing a response which is uh, contributing to what the response looks like at day zero. So we've done quite a bit of work using the pulses to try to learn something about how the system responds to a moving source. But I'm not going to have time to show you anything about that today. I just want to show you some characteristics of the pulse responses themselves, the building blocks. <laughs> 
So this picture is, is just showing you on average, averaged over the 24 uh, pulse experiments, uh, the amplitude of the response as a function of lag. So in these cases, these pictures are just formed by taking the response at, um, at, a, at a given lag for each of the 24 physicians, uh, longitudinally shifting them so that the heat source is in the same position um, and then taking an RMS of those responses. So you can see this top panel then is showing you the envelope of responses at day three. And so as we saw in the specific examples, the response is fairly close to the pulse. But by day six, you can see that um, maybe half of the Northern Hemisphere is, has been affected uh, by this short-lived pulse. And so now to uh, summarize uh, pictures like this, We've done some either longitudinal or uh, latitudinal averaging, and we can now produce pictures like this. So the left panel is showing you a longitudinal average so that we can now look at how the response to a pulse evolves with time as a function of latitude. And so you can see um, while the pulse is actually on, for the first two days, most of the response is nearby, in, near the tropical source and is, is growing very rapidly. Once the pulse is turned off, the uh, response evolves into mid-latitudes, is actually growing in amplitude, reaching an, a, a maximum amplitude almost a week after the pulse was first turned on. And mo perhaps most significantly, we continue to see its effect for more than two weeks in the Northern Hemisphere. The right-hand panel is if you do a latitudinal average just over uh, northern mid-latitudes. And so now we can look at the, how the evolution of longitude evolves. And the idea here is that the wave front is moving towards the east at about something like 20 meters per second or so. And so after 10 days, roughly 10 days, almost the entire northern hemisphere has felt the effect of this pulse, which only lasted two days. So if we look at um, another example of one of these pulses, we see another attribute. This is a pulse, this is the pulse at 135 east, um, showing you the lagged response at days three, six, and nine. And what I'd like you to notice is that um, most of the features in this are quasi-stationary. Even, uh, even though the pulse is highly time dependent, it's, it's, it's just this step function uh, uh, forcing, the response is, is very stationary in space. And a nice uh, demonstration of this property is if we do an experiment using the pulses in which we ask, suppose we had forcing in the tropics which was white in space and white in time, what would the, what would the structure, of, what would properties would the response to such a um, sequence of forcing look like? And that's what the, this bottom panel then is showing you. Uh, the red line is the spectrum uh, of the forcing that I'm using here. And so by design, it's, it's mostly, it's, it's very white um, for uh, periods longer than about five days. But the, res the, structure, the spectrum of the response is very red. So there's this huge um, mismatch between the temporal properties of the forcing and the response with the short uh, bursts producing long-lived responses. Now, a consequence of this is that the structure of the response to the pulses is actually very similar to the structure that one would get if one had done the conventional experiment in which one turns on a source and leaves it on indefinitely. That is, it turns out that the response to a pulse is structurally very similar to the response to a steady heat source. Another interesting uh, uh, property of these responses is that, in fact, they, are, they have um, um, striking um, properties in terms of what regions of the Northern Hemisphere are most influenced by these pulses. And so what I've done in this top diagram is show you an indication of the strength of the response in, in Northern mid-latitudes if one looks at 
the response to all 24 pulses, uh, combined uh, response to the 24 pulses. So the, the point here is that no region in the tropics is forced any more than any other region. So more, the tropics is more or less uniformly forced by these pulses, and yet the response is concentrated in three regions of the northern hemisphere. And what I especially uh, like is that if you just concentrate on these special regions, then the, the uh, effect of the pulse is, is even longer than we saw when we were averaging across longitude. So you can see that the response, say, near the dateline, continues to be felt for more than 20 days to the short-lived uh, forcing. The last thing I just wanted to point out is that uh, most of the diagrams that I've shown you have to do with the, the north-south wind response. Um, but in fact, of course, other fields are um, affected by a pulse. Here's an example again of the, of the, sort of the pulse at um, 135 east in terms of the response in sea level pressure, uh, near surface temperature, and the bottom sequence is of the storm, st a property of the storm tracks. And it's this last one that I find especially interesting from a dynamical standpoint, because this is telling us, and, and we have other evidence of this, that even though we're talking about the response to a tropical event that lasts a very short time, we can see the reaction in the storm tracks. And then in, not only are the storm tracks reacting, but they're acting, reacting in a, in a uh, dynamically important way. There's a positive feedback occurring. And so, in fact, uh, we have to be, include fairly sophisticated dynamics in order to understand completely uh, why the system is reacting to these short pulses in the way it does. So I don't want to go through the various points that I've tried to make. I just want to concentrate on these bottom two bullets, which have to do with implications of this, of this study. The one is that it's not necessary to predict the evolution of rainfall in the tropics in order to uh, gain from um, the predictability that's inherent in knowledge about rainfall in the tropics. It's, it's enough to just be able to predict it for a day or two. In fact, one doesn't even have to predict it at all, as long as if one included rainfall information in your assimilation uh, system, that's going to, in turn, uh, have a positive impact on forecasts at the two or three week range. The other implication I just wanted to bring up is that results like this uh, suggest that the attribution problem, at least for subseasonal variability, may be more, a little more difficult than one realizes because there's such a mismatch between the time scale of the forcing and the response so that um, one has to, maybe it's not obvious until you see experiments like this, that even if you're looking at the response for a month, for a weekly or monthly mean, you have to take into account the short events in the tropics. Thank you for your attention. So Grant, I've always been impressed at how much you can get out of these linear responses. And do you have a, where does it break down? I mean, have you looked at this particular problem where things become nonlinear? Everything you said seemed to have was seemed linear, uh, or you were assuming that it was linear. Anyway. I wanted to take, I wanted to allow for the possibility that nonlinear linearity is important. So that's why I, I did this more uh, complicated analysis. It turns out that, not not to anyone's surprise, to a first approximation, the linear um, dynamics are enough to qualitatively uh, tell you something about the kind of results I've shown you. I have reproduced many of these features just within a linear context. But the fact, the last result that I showed you where the storm tracks are um, reacting and feeding back onto uh, the reaction is telling you then that the linear framework is not going to be sufficient to, uh, to quantitatively uh, look at this phenomenon. I guess that's not obvious to me, but if you just multiply the size of your tropical heating by a factor of two, do you get a similar increase in the storm track response? A similar Is it linear in that simple sense? Or? Um, I cannot tell you that. I don't, I don't know that. 
and does that suggest a simple version as a linear model plus um, uh, uh, positive feedback on the barotropic component of middle latitudes, which is mimicking the effect of the storm track? Yes, but of course that's not a straightforward thing to do, and, we, and that's not the only um, additional dynamics which, which may... I just wondered how much that um, linear theory gives you the setup. And then a positive feedback on the barotropic component of middle latitudes will give you a lot else. I'm sure that this is a step towards the complete solution. Um, oh, it's very pretty what you've done. I think it's very nice. Uh, you didn't tell us much about your pulse. Was it in a thermodynamic equation, the heating? Yes. You just and how big? Um, it's max, it's a sinusoid in the vertical. Oh, okay. Just in the horizontal, its maximum uh, heating rate is five okay. degrees per day. So it, the, it's equivalent to like a four millimeter per day. Okay. Okay. That's I just want to know. So it's kind of in the range of the kind of things that oh, we yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, but the three maximum responses you got in the middle latitude, irrespective of what, did this longitude by any chance coincide with the blocking uh, locations? Well, what they co coincide with are regions of um, high intrinsic low frequency variability. So these are regions where the low frequency variability uh, is, is naturally strong. But are they not the uh, jet exit regions of the chronological? Well, uh, two of them are. There's, there's also yeah. one over North um, Asia, which is. Uh, that is a walking. Yeah, right, right. Yeah.